A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, this is Victoria Meyer. Welcome to The Chemical Show. Today, I am recording a solo podcast specifically to talk about how chemical companies can and should be managing and leading through these current economic times. We are certainly facing inflation. There's no doubt about that. Uh, There's some discussion whether or not we're in a recession or entering a recession and, and points of view across a variety of economists differ on that. But as I talk to clients, as I talk to people across the industry, how they're managing inflation, how they're handling um, current the current business environment and where it may go is certainly a topic. So today what I've done is I've gone out and asked and received input from over 20 leaders across the chemical industry, focusing in on how they're handling it. And from those inputs and from other inputs, I've really distilled it down to some best practices in terms of how companies can and should be approaching the current economic environment when we look at inflation and a potential recession and more. So there is no doubt about it. Where we sit today, inflation is a fact, right? As individuals, we see it in our pocketbooks. We see this across the globe. So we're, it varies by region. So the U.S. is currently seeing somewhere between 6 and 8% inflation. The U.K. is seeing 7 to 9%. Italy's close to that. Switzerland is a nominal 2%, but for them, that's a high percentage. And in fact, when we look at inputs coming from the World Economic Forum, the OECD, there is no doubt about it. In fact, the Consumer Price Index, which of course is a key indicator for all of us, coming from the OECD shows a 9% increase in April. We'll see where it plays out in May and June, July, as we're here recording this. That report lags by a couple of months, but there's no doubt that inflation is here consumers are feeling it, and it's starting to impact different parts of the industry differently. Where are these influences coming from? What's causing this, right? So no doubt about it, energy, oil has been up above $100 a barrel, although it's dropping in the latest reports I saw said it may get down to like $65 by the end of the year. We will see, but certainly oil prices is high, natural gas, gas prices is high, electricity as a result of that is high. The war, the conflict in Russia and Ukraine is definitely an impact. And then, of course, some of this, and and we've been talking about and seeing this over the past couple of years, is the effect of stimulus spending, right? During the pandemic, as many people stayed home, many people, many individuals and families, economies, their own personal economics, ability to work, et cetera, because was impacted, we saw stimulus spending from a, in a variety of countries and regions, which certainly in many ways overheated the economy in certain markets. We know that there's, you know, it shifted demand patterns when we looked at what was going on, right? So as everybody stayed home, there was a lot of home repairs, new homes, pools, all kinds of excitement. And now that the economy and the, the borders are back open as COVID has reduced an impact, we're seeing airplanes full, hotels are full, et cetera. So people's purchasing patterns have changed significantly over the past two years. And certainly as we look at 2022, where they're spending today versus where they were a year ago, completely different. A recession is less certain, right? So the technical definition of a recession is a fall in GDP in two successive quarters. Somebody else is going to report on that. It's not my my thing. But I think you know, we need to be prepared. And in fact, as you know, I talked to some financial experts, they said, yeah, we think it's coming and we're advising our clients to get their financial houses in order. Nonetheless, whether we're in recession or whether it just feels like a recession, we're certainly seeing that, right? So again, stimulus spending, we're seeing the demise in stimulus spending. 
right? We're hearing that because of the high cost of goods, whether it be gasoline and for automobiles, energy prices and electricity, people are tapping into some of those savings that they might've had over the last couple of years as they weren't going out and about and as they were receiving stimulus checks. But we're certainly seeing that a reduction in some spending patterns in a lot of industries, especially durable goods, especially elsewhere. Now, when you talk to folks and when you talk to different economists and different people that are monitoring this, some of this may be a just a return to a steady state equilibrium. We're certainly not there. But if you think about this in the context of uh, process control, and, and as a former plant and process control person, I do, you know, we saw a spike over the last couple of years and now we're seeing it come back down. But every reaction settles. It doesn't settle evenly, right? So there's a bit of this is not a smooth and steady return to our normal equilibrium, normal markets, et cetera. So it may feel like a recession, may look like a recession. And, you know, we probably should be acting like it's a recession. What's interesting, when I talk to various leaders, they don't seem hugely concerned. Yeah, they're monitoring this. No doubt about it. Nobody's got their, they're not ostriches with their head in the sand, but they're certainly taking this with a moderate approach, right? Monitoring, ensuring that there are good business practices in place, but right now business is still strong. And in fact, I talked to one leader who said, I I just can't even imagine this. We have like two days of inventory in the network how a, de- a drop in demand is, you know, is that going to really affect us? Hard to say, because we are so focused today on making products, shipping it to customers, et cetera. Now, I will sell you. I mean, there's a danger in that, right? If you are, if we're not looking up and out and around at what's going on in the market and what might be coming, you're in danger of missing it and being and not responding quickly enough. So I would say most companies and most of the executives I've spoken with they're monitoring, they're taking steps to prepare, but they're not overly worrying about it. What are some of the indicators that people are watching, right? So the things that you would expect, housing inventory, housing sales, right? Consumer demand, how that consumer price index is tracking, consumer defaults, right? So looking at personal financial impacts, right? Retail inventory, and that's that's an interesting one, right? Because I think we've all heard the stories stories, the news and information that many large retailers have seen an abundance of inventory because they pre-ordered because supply chains were so sluggish for so long over the past two years. And, And while supply chains are steadying out, people are starting to receive those orders that they purchased. And yet consumers may or may not want it. There's a lot of inventory that they've got. So there's going to be a balancing of that. You know, actually, when I when I talk to a couple of leaders, they're like, eh, the retailers have know how to figure this out. This is not new. And they are figuring it out. We just, you know, need to be on top of it and keep monitoring it. Interest rates, of course, is another one. Employment rates. And employment rates are actually a good news, bad news thing. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But, you know, those are some of the things that people are watching for. So housing inventory and sales, consumer defaults, retail inventory, um, the Fed and interest rates, employment rates, consumer demand. What are you watching for? Send me a message and let me know. That would be awesome. So here are five things though. So five best practices and five steps to winning, if you will, inflationary and recessionary markets. So the first is good financial management. I mean, the reality is this should be true at all times. But as we all know, when you're feeling richer, you might spend richer. When you're feeling poor, you're spend poor. This is true across, you know, as true as individuals as it is in business leaders and companies. So managing cash. For some businesses, this is not a change. They have a cash focus, but managing cash is critical. Understanding and reassessing credit risk is critical. And and if you haven't done this with your customers um, yet, you do it. And And obviously over the past couple of years, as prices have increased, as the um, market has changed, that's been understood. But now as we move into higher inflation, higher interest rates, this definitely changes the credit profile and potentially the credit risk of your portfolio of customers and your individual customers. So understanding cash, managing and reassessing credit risk is critical. We'll be right back. 
At EcoVist, they're accelerating the transition to a sustainability-driven future. Their long history of innovation, expertise, and customer collaboration supports the development of proprietary catalysts and services across their two industry-leading businesses, Advanced Materials and Catalysts and Eco Services. Advanced Materials and Catalysts is a leader in proprietary and customized technologies for polymers, cleaner fuels, emissions control, and circularity. EcoServices is the largest North American recycler of spent sulfuric acid. EcoVist, your catalyst for positive change. The second piece is disciplined SNOP or sales and operations planning. And so I think a lot of companies feel like they've gotten really good at this over the past couple of years because of the variability and the instability in the supply chain. But the reality is, you know, this is another look, more disciplined SNOP, which looks like optimizing inventory and working capital, right? As, as one leader I spoke with said, we don't want to get stuck with a lot of high-priced inventory or with the wrong inventory. And in fact, so that's one aspect of it, better forecasting. Uh, sometimes that feels like a pipe dream right? You're relying on your customers, you're relying on your sales teams, you're relying on other people to help you forecast. But forecasting is a big part of a disciplined SNOP. As one distributor uh, executive told me, we are being careful buyers and being smart really about products and inventory purchased and then shifting inventory management from FIFO or first in, first out, to really moving the most expensive or LIFO sometimes it might be considered um, last in, first out. It's interesting. Right after I, I got this input from uh, this executive, there it was showing up in the paper on a, in a different context. So I think this is something that definitely the chemical industry is looking at and other industries are looking at. Making sure you're not getting stuck with high-priced inventory, being more, being wise about what your inventory, your safety stocks, your other things are. That leads me into scenario planning. It's number three. So, you know, this is one of these topics. And I, I actually, some executives say, and I talked to somebody who said, well, we don't like to do a lot of scenario planning because the scenarios are always wrong. They are. It is rare for a scenario to be right <laughs> because by its very nature, it's uncertain. But the reality of scenario planning is It allows you to have a point of view, understand what the impact may be, particularly when we look at global businesses where impact of inflation and recession is going to be different. You need to know those. And regional impacts, we need to understand duration. Well, it's very different if we're in a period of recession for three months versus 12 months or 18 months or longer, right? So understanding putting together scenarios that reflect duration, regional impacts, product line impacts is critical. The fourth thing is finding and creating opportunities and really creating opportunities. And what's really interesting is across the board, almost all the leaders I spoke with see inflationary and recessionary times as a time of opportunity. I recently participated in a roundtable for SOCBA and we asked this question. It was, you know, are you concerned about inflation? Are you concerned about recession? And overall, what they said is inflation and recession creates opportunities. In the case of SOCMA, a lot of these individuals, these companies are doing custom manufacturing. They're doing creating custom blends. They're doing uh, fine chemicals and custom chemicals. And so what they see is as interest rates go up, their customers, the bigger companies, are being more disciplined in their financial management. They're being more disciplined in investment. And so that creates opportunity. They can't build a plant or they can't afford to allocate space in their current assets to making a new product or to making a smaller product, which then shifts over to folks that are in Sockmas wheelhouse. That's their business, custom manufacturing, tolling, et cetera. There's a point of view that many of the services are in a better cost position. Greater opportunities. So Austin from Blue Palette, when he and I uh, connected, he sees this as an opportunity for even greater opportunities for their platform, right? So that they're in a unique position that as 
inflation increases, if a recession hits as markets soften, which we're starting to see a little bit, that there's more people moving to their platform. So it's kind of a uh, build it before they come and they need it, but it, it's turning what could be a, a bad op, a bad environment marketplace and environment into an opportunity for Blue Palette. And then the other piece that people was, you know, the number of executives really talked about, and I believe this is labor. This could be a good thing. So, you know, hear me out. So the point of view of this is, we certainly know that the stock market has gone down. Retirement savings has decreased. Uh, It's just costing more to live at the moment. It's costing more to fill up your car with gasoline. If you're running an EV, it's costing more to recharge your car in an EV. It's costing more to purchase groceries for your family. And so this actually could be driving more people into the labor market. So, you know, what I'm hearing from folks is a couple of things. One is just monitoring labor carefully, right? So depending on where you are in the market and what your current situation is, maybe you delay making some hiring decisions. And in other cases, and we have a number of companies and across the industry that are having a challenges in hiring people. This creates opportunity. Getting more people into the workforce may be one of the outcomes of the inflationary times that we're in, which in turn can be actually really good for companies ready to hire, looking to hire and bring more people onto the team. The fifth thing is really about creating differentiation. So, you know, in fact, that came through from a, a couple of folks. And I believe this really, I mean, I think, and you guys have heard me say this before, and, and certainly um, people I consult with and work with know value comes through differentiation. And during an inflationary and recessionary time, figuring out your points of differentiation and maximizing them becomes critical. It creates opportunities. So when we think about products that are maybe more sustainable or green, circularity, Companies that can bring those kinds of products to market faster, if they're already ready, if they're in their portfolio, that's going to have durability. It's going to drive demand. Services, the customer experience. How are you serving your customers? The reality is, in all times, customers have a choice. But inflationary times, and if there is some demand destruction, which is possible, markets start getting a little bit longer, the customer experience becomes ever more important because customers have a choice and they're going to go not just where they get the best product because frankly, products are pretty easily replicated. They're going to where they get the best experience. So do you understand your customer's experience? Are you treating them as valued customers? Are you making their customer journey easier? That's something that you can do to really create differentiation and to drive opportunity in these markets. The last thing is really, I'm going to, I'm calling it an enabler. And this is around digital transformation. When I spoke with Martijn Van Norden a couple months ago on the podcast, one of the things he said is hard times is when customers that have really, or companies that have really taken action on digital transformation will reap their rewards. It's kind of hard to start today and expect to see results today. So, you know, as they say, what was the best time to plant a tree 20 years ago? When's the second best time today? I would say in the case of digital transformation, you know, when was the best time to start your digital transformation? Oh, I don't know, five years ago, maybe more. When's the second best time today? And if you've already started to really embrace a new way of working as a result of digital, digital transformation, digital business processes, you're in the place to reap the rewards, whether it be through streamlined business processes, whether it's about your customer and supplier journeys and having a better clarity on that in terms of what it is and how you engage. And then it's also around data and analytics because, you know, companies that are going to have more robust digital data, digital analytics, that an oxymoron, maybe, they're going to have more success, especially as if and when we hit a recession, certainly during these inflationary times that we're in. So, you know, that's what I'm hearing, folks. And that's what I see. And that's what I see as ways that you can really win and win in these markets in inflationary and recessionary times. Anyway, I'd love to hear what you think. Reach out to me, send me an email, um, send me a message on LinkedIn and tell me what you and your company are doing 
to create opportunities and be more robust and resilient in these inflationary times. We'll talk to you again later. Thanks for listening to The Chemical Show. Bye-bye. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. Simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.